Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Community Connections featuring today's topic, grief. As a reminder to anyone that's tuning in on Zoom, um, you can enter any questions into the chat box so that we can address them at the end. And today's event is also being recorded and may be found on the Community Hospice and Health Services YouTube channel shortly after. And now I'm gonna introduce our speaker for today, Kim Raymond. Kim is a licensed marriage and family therapist having worked in the field for over 14 years. She has experience working with domestic violence and sexual assault survivors, foster and adoptive youth, as well as high risk youth. Kim has now been with Community Hospice and Health Services within the, the Mental Health Counseling Program for one and a half years. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Kim. All right. Thank you. Okay, well, it's it's a ladies group today. All right, so we get to have some girl time. Um, so just real briefly, um, I'm, I want to get a feel kind of for uh, the room. Um, if you could just raise your hand if you've had a loss within the past year. Okay, so um, we're going to start off by talking about grief more generally, but especially since we're into the holiday season, um, I wanted to give out some tips for uh, coping around the holidays as well, especially if it's your first holiday season without your loved one. Okay. And if at any point you guys have a question or you're like, Kim, can you clarify that? Just shoot it out and let me know. Okay. All right. Or not. <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay. I think I had it upside down. Um, so I, I really like this quote. Grief is the form that love takes after someone you love dies. The point isn't to put these feelings behind you all together. That's not possible or even desirable. The point is to gain perspective and help grief find its rightful place in a person's life. Uh, I just feel like it really captures um, what our general outlook and kind of the expectations we have of ourself um, should be around grief. Uh, we always say grief is learning to live with the love that person left behind. Oops, wrong way. Okay, so I can't emphasize enough that grief is a normal human experience. Um, it's something we are literally wired for. Uh, so how we experience it and what it looks like can vary very much so, not just from person to person, but even based on the type of loss we're experiencing, we can see differences. I've, I've seen where people are like, you know, I was reacting this way when I had this loss, but it's not happening this time. And, and sometimes that can be kind of confusing or I'm seeing where people um, will sometimes judge themselves for not maybe responding in, in the same way. Um, so again, and if you think about it, it, it makes sense because grief definitely gets impacted by the type of relationship we had with that person. So just know that the way you experience grief can be very different from one loss to another loss. Um, we're going to talk about the stages of grief, just because most of us at some point in time have heard maybe a little bit about it. And I definitely want to clear up um, just some some false beliefs or some myths around stages of grief. Um, so kind of like I was saying, or starting to touch on, you know, grief doesn't come in this, this neat little package. Um, it can look completely different from one person to the other, or from one, one experience to the other. Uh, so it's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, sometimes it can creep up when we least expect it. Um, there's definitely certain things such as the holiday time where maybe we kind of anticipate, okay, you know, this day might be a little bit more challenging, but then there's moments where you're walking through the grocery store and you see the soap they always used or their favorite vegetable. 
and that triggers it and you didn't expect it to. So it's things like that that can pop up. Um, hmm. that we may take steps forward or backward during our grief journey. That's so important. And we refer to grief as a journey because again, it's, it's not something that has an end point. It's not a, okay. You know, we hear a lot of people say, oh, give it a year. That's pretty common, a common phrase we hear. And that does not capture it correctly. Um, it's not like you suddenly hit a year and you're all done grieving and you can kind of box it up and, and put it on a shelf. That's not how grief works. Um, and so sometimes uh, when someone does have a moment, maybe they feel like, okay, I've, I've been adjusting, you know, kind of to my, my new normal without this person, finding ways to connect. And then suddenly I have a hard day. And I've seen where people look at that and feel like, oh, I haven't made any progress or I'm going backwards and it's just not true. So it's really important that you don't judge yourself um, for how you're responding or what triggers you. So much of it is just, again, that normal human process. Okay. All right. So by all means, this is not a, a full and complete list. Um, but in terms of when we look at the different ways that grief can impact us, these are just a few of the highlights because it affects us on every level. It affects us physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Um, so some of these things can just be some common symptoms that people tend to experience. Uh, and, and, and something I always like to address is, you know, we'll, we'll sometimes hear people say like, oh, I'm so depressed. Um, and we even see where the word depression, it's one of the stages gets used. Um, but again, I just really want to make it clear that grief and like a true clinical depression are not the same thing. Okay. They are very different things. Although we hear the word depression kind of get weaved into grief talk a lot and kind of the best way to really clarify that difference is, as I said, when we first started, grief is a normal human reaction. It is part of every human's experience. A true clinical depression is not, that is not something that happens to everyone that everyone experiences. Um, but it gets confusing because a lot of the symptoms overlap. Um, you know, it's common with both grief and depression to lack energy, lack motivation, struggle with concentration, struggle with sleep, to find yourself stress eating, or maybe to have no appetite at all. And so when you see that overlap, it, those are some of the things that, that can sometimes make it confusing. Um, but like I said, they're two very different things. Another big highlight between those two differences is with a true clinical depression, that person feels that depressed mood constant. And sometimes they don't even know why. Whereas with grief, we know why. And you get moments of relief. It's possible to still have moments of joy and peace and contentment with grief. So again, those are just a, a few of the differences between those two. Okay, so just a little bit more um, about just some of the things that we experience with grief, just again, normal reactions. Between those two lists, does anything jump out at anyone? Or do any of these resonate with you? You don't have to say specifically what type, but does it look a little like, oh yeah, I could see that. Okay. Close, so 
if they're going to send you home with me, it's for a fear that I might harm you. My brother is mm-hmm. harmed. <laughs> my one brother here is too late. I can't stop him. I think it's just that. They think they probably won't be seeing her long because of the weather. So your loss is extremely fresh. It's only been a couple of weeks. Okay. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're, we're actually just within these next couple of slides, we're actually going to talk about, because that is really common to feel like I'm not feeling anything or to have the feelings of guilt come up. Super, super common. Yeah. Okay. So um, if you were to do an internet search nowadays on the stages of grief, you're going to see five stages of grief, seven stages of grief, eight stages of grief. Um, but this is like the, the original um, stages of grief. And so um, I'm going to go through each of them specifically, but um, a few overall things to keep in mind is, yes, you'll notice that they're listed in a one, two, three, four, five order, um, but two really important things to keep in mind. Not everyone experiences these stages or all five stages, okay? Okay. The other big thing is they don't necessarily go in this order, okay? So it's normal for it to jump around or to feel like, okay, you know, I, I, I had some anger. I felt that, you know, I was moving more towards depression or acceptance. And then all of a sudden I'm feeling anger again. That doesn't mean you've gone backwards. Okay. Um, it's so I, I just want you to keep that in mind. Um, it can be helpful as a guide in, in understanding what you're experiencing, which is why I like to go over the stages of grief. But again, it's unique to each person. Okay. Okay. So the first stage denial, I, I prefer to call it shock. I feel shock captures it better. Um, and it's pretty amazing what the human brain does, um, just how much it wants to protect us, not just physically, but mentally and emotionally as well. And so if we were to feel everything that we feel when a loss first happens, we'd be completely flooded. It would thoroughly overwhelm us. So our brain jumps in and says, I don't want that to happen. That doesn't feel emotionally safe. And it puts us in this phase of shock um, because it allows us to slowly take in and process and feel the effects of the loss without it feeling like this sudden just hit and bombardment. Um, So like I said, it's just kind of a, a natural protective instinct that our brain does. Um, now again, how long you feel that shock, it can vary. And again, just like humans, we're not these, you know, nice, neat, black and white, you know, human beings were complicated. We're able to feel more than one emotion at a time. Things can sometimes have a gradual transition. Um, so more so what I see is it's not that someone goes from being in, in shock to not in shock but it's more of it's, oh, I'm starting to have moments where I'm feeling it more or it's feeling more real. Um, so it it's a little, kind of a, a gentler flow a lot of the times. Um, oh, I just had a thought and I lost it. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, got it. So uh, there can also be a difference between um, an anticipated loss versus an unexpected loss. So, um, you know, that can very much be 
even though we can go through the stages in, in either type of loss, uh, that does make a difference. Whether, you know, when we know someone maybe has cancer, or isn't doing well, we're seeing that gradual decline versus someone who, um, you know, especially when we were dealing with COVID, where it's like a sudden loss or maybe someone has a heart attack, it's just unexpected. Um, Again, it varies from person to person, but sometimes with unexpected loss, um, it's very normal for the shock to feel a little bit more intense or to last a little bit longer. Okay, anger. So anger tends to be one of the first emotions we experience um, for a few different reasons. Anger can sometimes make us feel in control or um, empowered. Anger tends to not make us feel as vulnerable. And again, in our society in general, anger tends to be a more, I'm going to say, acceptable emotion, um, especially when we look at males. You know, it tends to be a lot more acceptable or easier for a male to show anger versus sadness or fear. Um, so those are a few reasons why anger tends to be one of the first emotions that that come up. Um, because again, this is where some of the, this is where you're seeing that shock starting to wear off and we're starting to really take in and understand the loss. And so now comes in the, the emotion where maybe we're not feeling as numb anymore. Um, and the anger can be aimed at a, a variety of things. It can be aimed at doctors, ourselves, um, a higher power. Sometimes we can feel angry with things and we don't know why. So just kind of some general irritability is really normal. Um, and feelings of resentment and guilt are also really common in this phase. Okay, bargaining. I always describe bargaining as the what if stage. That's when kind of we're reflecting back and, you know, we, we ask ourselves, mm, what if, what if the doctors had caught it sooner? You know, what if maybe we had done this differently? It's, it's looking at, could this person still be here? Could there be a different result if something different had happened? And, um, and so because of that, and again, we're continuing to feel more because that shock is wearing off. Um, it can cause us to also reflect back on our relationship with that person and start to potentially feel any regrets that we might have. Um, and that's really hard. I always say guilt is an emotion that can kind of eat you, eat you alive from the inside out. Um, so that's, I think that's what makes this stage challenging. Okay. So depression, um, kind of the highlight on this stage is you're at the point where you're really feeling the reality of the loss. Um, kind of the, the shock has worn off. Um, and it's a, okay, I, I I'm feeling, um, I'm feeling that this person is no longer physically here. So in tends to come more of the feelings of sadness. Um, you might feel a little bit more lethargic, um, not as motivated. Um, things like that are really normal. Come on in. All right. Whoops, I went the wrong way again. So this, this last phase is acceptance. Um, so it, basically it's, you've reached the point where um, not only do you feel the loss and, and you've been processing it, but you've come to the place of accepting that that person is gone. Now, here's the key thing. Just because you've accepted the loss does not mean that you don't feel sad anymore. Okay. I like to crush that, that myth right away. It is okay to feel sad. This, this doesn't mean, okay, I feel happy again and I'm moving forward and I'm doing all the things I would normally do. No, 
um, it's okay to still feel sad at this point. Any questions about those? Okay. Okay, so a few general tips, kind of like I was saying before, it's not about getting over a loss. It's we learn to live with grief. Now, not to make that sound doom and gloom, <laughs> um, keep in mind that grief changes. I can't emphasize that enough. So the tough moments don't happen as often. Um, they start to become not as intense. Uh, those are a couple of really common things that we see happen as you go along your grief journey. Um, and the other thing is, is we tend to hear people say, oh, again, give it time. It's not just time. Um, it's important that you're allowing yourself to feel your grief. Because if someone is, is denying that and pushing that away, time isn't going to to solve or, you know, help you heal your grief. Um, it's important that you are allowing yourself to feel what you feel. Um, again, just another reminder, don't compare yourself to others. So um, any sentence that you might find yourself saying that starts with like, oh, I should uh, or shouldn't, that's a key sign that you need to get rid of that, get rid of that thought, get rid of that statement. Um, because that's just a, a judgment statement. Okay. Um, I, I, something that I find that people tend to judge themselves a lot on is crying. There's this expectation that I should just be falling apart in tears. Um, so why am I not crying? Um, and then sometimes I've seen where people feel like, oh, does that make me a bad person? Because I'm not crying over this person. I'm not falling over in tears. Do not judge yourself because again, um, the way, the way you grieve is going to look different from other people and also between the types of losses you experience. Um, again, we're, we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Um, grief often is a balance of you don't want to jump from one extreme to the, to the other. It's finding the gray a lot of the time. So this fourth bullet point talks about, you know, not walking that road alone, not isolating. Um, but at the same time, don't feel like you have to be a social butterfly all the time. You need that balance of you need time to yourself um, while also finding ways to be able to connect with others, whether it's people who um, you feel like understand you and can relate to you or just connecting with people where you can, you can have some time of peace and enjoyment. Just because you're having a moment of fun or happiness, that also tends to cause feelings of guilt I've seen. It doesn't take away anything from the love you have of, of the person that you lost, okay? It's not a reflection of your relationship or your love or how much you miss them, okay? Because again, it is normal with grief to have moments of joy and happiness. And then the last thing is keeping in mind that grief is strongly influenced by um, culture, spirituality, and then also what we experienced. Um, when I work with people, I often like to ask about, you know, did you have a uh, did you have a loss when you were a child growing up? What did you see? How did you see the adults around you reacting and responding? Um, what was the response to you? Was it something that was allowed to be talked about? Um, because again, just like with everything else in life, we learn from a young age um, how to respond to grief and what it is. And so sometimes that can set the tone or the expectations we have for ourselves. Uh, for how we grieve now. Okay. So I wanted to include this because, um, you know, sometimes there might be moments where you feel like, okay, I'm, I'm trying to do things to take care of myself or to make the pain not feel so intense, but just nothing seems to be working. Um, 
Yes, that that's a hard moment. It's a normal moment though too. Um, and to keep in mind that I always say feelings are like visitors. They come and go. So the pain you were feeling in the moment is not going to be how you always feel. And I know it can be hard to imagine, especially when a loss is recent, it can be really hard to imagine feeling differently. Uh, but it's just kind of having that faith and trust and knowing that this is how I feel now, but this isn't how I'm always going to feel. So be gentle with yourself. Okay. Oh, oh, wait a minute. I got a little ahead of myself here. Okay. So um, an important part of grief is finding ways to still feel connected to your loved one. Um, you know, obviously everyone has different uh, beliefs, but in, in general, just because someone isn't physically here doesn't mean that we can't still feel connected to them. Um, so, you know, part of grief is some trial and error. <laughs> it's trying things out and, and figuring out, you know, what feels right to you? What do you enjoy? Um, the other thing to keep in mind is sometimes these things can go either way, depending on where you're at in your grief process. And what I mean by that is for someone, they might say that, you know, talking to their loved one um, or looking at their picture is very comforting. Whereas for someone else, they're like, no, that's way too painful. I can't do that yet. Um, keep in mind that just because maybe some, some of these ideas don't feel comforting now, don't completely toss them to the side because as you move through your grief journey, you might see that change where, you know, you hit the point of where looking at their picture or talking about them um, doesn't feel so painful. Um, you know, it, it can be, I describe it as heartwarming sometimes. You can kind of feel that transition. So um, again, I'm just going to kind of go through these. Um, I mentioned, you know, talking, sometimes people like to, to hold up a picture um, I've seen people where they, they have a morning cup of coffee with their loved one and they just kind of talk with them, uh, flipping through the newspaper and, and chatting about the newspaper with them. Um, sometimes people like to make it, uh, our brain processes information differently, uh, when we're thinking it, we're writing it, we're speaking it. Um, so sometimes actually writing it out, um, can be more, more appealing or have a different feel to it. Uh, Continuing to engage in activities that maybe you guys did together or is something that your loved one really enjoyed. Um, uh, another neat idea is making a, um, you can make like a playlist of, it could be their favorite songs or just songs that remind you of them or songs that were special to the two of you. Um, and same thing with foods, especially with holidays coming up, you know, is there you know, a, a favorite side dish or a favorite meal that they always um, enjoyed. Uh, getting a little creative, looking at me, uh, musical instruments or um, engaging in art, whether it's drawing, painting, crafting in any form. Um, and maybe it's not necessarily something that reminds you of them or that they enjoyed, but if it just is comforting to you um, and expressing your grief or in feeling connected to them, go for it. Uh, wearing their perfume, cologne, um, an article of clothing that belonged to them, cuddling with their pillow blanket or other comfort items, uh, kind of on a larger scale, carrying out plans, goals, dreams you had together or that your loved one wanted to accomplish. And then of course, looking at pictures, videos, and other memorabilia of their life or the adventures you shared. And by the way, if there's anything that um, anyone in the room has done or just an idea you have, please share if you're comfortable because I always love to grow this list. Yeah. Yes.
Yes. Thank you for mentioning that. So for the people on Zoom, it, it, with the other idea mentioned was um, watching their favorite um, TV series or favorite movie, things like that. Okay. So this idea I just recently came across and I really loved it. Um, so it says, you know, if you're finding it hard to connect, um, to connect with the present, meaning it's, you're finding it hard to just kind of be focused or mindful about the present moment, um, or just feeling overwhelmed. Um, I like the mindfulness piece to this. It's, stopping in and looking around and finding five to 10 ways that your person is still present. And it gives some ideas looking at objects, traditions, uh, your child's left, your shared values. It can be, um, you know, looking at maybe you have shared uh, physical features like same eye color. Um, it can be shared personality qualities. Um, it can be things that you both enjoyed. Uh, but I just thought this was a really neat idea, um, to, to kind of, okay, how can I still feel that person's presence in my life? Okay. So kind of transitioning a bit to looking at, um, grief and the holidays. So especially if this is your first holiday season, um, you know, it's, it's natural for it to be challenging. Um, it's trying to figure out how to do the holidays in, in a different way. Um, you know, memory serves as a constant reminders of the loss when, you know, we're bombarded with TV commercials of family gatherings and get togethers and, um, you know, or, or just seeing it, you know, that can, that can be hard. Um, and it's okay to feel envious or jealous or angry when seeing those things. Um, because it's okay to feel like oh, I've, I've been robbed of that, or I don't get to do that anymore. That's completely natural. Um, so just knowing that if these types of things come up, it is 100% normal and part of the grief process. So, um, again, you might have questions thinking about, okay, how do we typically do, you know, different holidays? What role did that person play? Who's going to do it this year? How might that look different? Um, again, feeling like, oh, I don't know if I'm just up for naturally all the work that comes with the holidays as well, right? Of the, the cooking, the cleaning, the <laughs> The shopping, um, that can feel really overwhelming. Um, feeling like I don't even want to do the holidays this year. Totally normal. Um, and also having a fear of, I definitely have seen people say like, I'm worried if I go, I might, you know, get sad and start crying and worrying about how that's going to make other people feel or feeling like that could be embarrassing or whatever it might be. I've, I've heard a variety of things but just worry about, quote, being able to hold it together um, if you're at some sort of holiday social function are all really common fears and thoughts. So what I'm going to kind of talk with you guys about is planning for, not just for the holidays, but any significant day, whether it's a birthday, a wedding anniversary, um, those sorts of things, it's kind of like this fine dance of it's best to plan. Okay. Um, but giving yourself grace to change that plan. <laughs> so we say plan because when we plan, um, it helps to increase our sense of control, which is naturally calming and soothing to our brain human brain does not like, um, not knowing what to expect because it makes it feel unsafe. Um, so that's why it's so common for a lot of us to struggle with sitting in the unknown. Um, some of us do it better than others, but pretty, pretty common struggle. So, um, it, it's also important because it gives you a chance to think about what's important to me going into this holiday, this birthday, whatever it might be, you know, what's important to me that I have, I don't have, that we do, 
Um, so that way, when the day comes, you don't feel like you're scrambling or you feel like, oh, I, I wish we could have done this. Um, so it helps to make sure that things that are important to you or that are comforting to you, um, if it takes a little bit of planning or arranging, you're able to do that. So this next one talks about um, just some food for thought questions. So thinking about, you know, what traditions are meaningful to you that you want to keep? Maybe what are some traditions that you're interested in, I say, tweaking or adjusting or maybe completely getting rid of? Um, who can support you uh, during that? Um, how will those choices or those changes potentially affect others? Um, if it's, you know, a, a group gathering, uh, how can you honor the memory of your loved one during, during that, um, during the holiday or that gathering? Um, and not only what is your plan, but what's plan B. So a lot of the times it's the leading up to, uh, the holiday or the birthday that's really anxiety provoking because of the. I don't know what it's going to be like, or I don't know how I'm going to feel, even if you have a plan. Um, so it's, it's common for the, the lead up to the actual day to sometimes be more stressful than the holiday itself. At the same time, I have had people say, no, the holiday itself was really tough. Um, so as I had mentioned, it's, it's this fine dance of having a plan but come day of, you might feel differently. You might feel like, mm, I don't want to do that anymore. Or mm, this is important to me. It's okay to change. Um, it's really important that you follow your gut and do what feels right for you. So again, getting rid of those, those should statements that maybe float through your head. So we're going to kind of go over, um, again, this is not a full list, but just some different ideas of how to uh, feel connected to your loved one um, and to honor them uh, on, on special occasions. So um, there's always lighting a candle on, on, the, ment on the mantle, um, especially if they had like a favorite, um, a favorite scent or if there's a scent that um, reminds you of them, uh, you know, smell can be um, really significant uh, in, in uh, impacting our feelings and making us feel connected. Um, the next idea, you could do this a couple different ways, um, but hanging a Christmas stocking. And if you're having family and friends over, you know, you could put out little um, pieces of paper and have everyone, you know, write down a favorite memory or, um, just something that they appreciated about that person, um, anything about that person. And then you fill the stocking. And then if you want, you can look at it privately after everyone's gone. Um, you can pull them out and discuss them as a group. Um, so that is very holiday specific. Um, another idea is very similar, but even just taking a notebook um, and passing it around the room and ha having everyone write down, you know, a favorite memory, that sort of thing. And then that way it's, it's something you can keep. It's just like this, this book of what this person represented and who they were to, um, the people, uh, in your lives. Uh, this bottom one was neat by a live Christmas tree and plant it outside in memory of that person. Um, you know, trees often symbolize growth and, uh, and life continuing. Um, so again, sometimes utilizing trees can be very symbolic. Okay. Um, so it's giving the money you would have spent on gifts for that person to um, a needy family, a favorite charity, or even still buying an actual gift for that person. And you can put it under the tree and you can open it up and hold on to it or give it to someone in need. Um, sending a poinsettia to a church in that person's memory. 
um, hanging a special ornament that either you buy or that you make. If you go to Dollar Tree, uh, usually around this time of year, you know, I guess a dollar twenty-five, right? Um, they have these little plastic clear ornaments, um, and they're cute. They're they have like just a a traditional ball shape, but then they also have um, like holiday shape ones as well that you can fill with beads, ribbon, you know, feathers, whatever you want, um, and really personalize it that way. And sometimes that can be a fun thing to do, especially if um, they're small children. That can be a fun way for them to talk about um, a loved one and remember them as letting them make an ornament. Um, oh, actually, before I do that, um, so again, all of those ideas we talked about earlier on with, with um, when we were talking about grief more in general, you know, thinking about what was their favorite food, their favorite music, all those things can be incorporated as well during the holiday time. Um, another idea is sometimes it's called the empty chair, where uh, you'll have a extra chair still at the Thanksgiving table, or sometimes a picture of that person just to recognize uh, their presence. Um, something I've seen done where, you know, we talked about wearing an article of that person's clothing. Um, but I know uh, I've seen where someone wore something that only they knew they were wearing. Um, you know, a necklace, but that was tucked into the shirt or a pair of socks. And it just, it can make it feel a little bit more, um, a little bit more intimate because it's only something that you know about that's connecting you to them. Okay, now I'm ready to go on. Okay, so something that a lot of us don't think about with grief is boundaries. Boundaries are really important with grief. Um, and so it's important to be aware of what your your boundaries are and that you respect setting those and know that it's okay. Um, when I say boundaries, you can see it in a variety of ways. It's, it's okay to say no to maybe going out on, um, you know, a, uh, going out to lunch or dinner with someone if you don't if you don't feel like yeah, I'm not ready for that or I'm not up to that that's okay um it can be recognizing I don't have the energy to maybe do as much cooking or preparations or decorating helping out with holiday preparation as much this year that's okay it's important that um you're able to express that and and make that known um and again, and it talks about being okay with um, things don't have to be black and white. It doesn't have to be, we're going to do it exactly the way we always have, or we're going to do it totally different. We can blend it, keep the things you want to keep um, and bring in new pieces that you want to, you want to bring in. And again, remember that what you do this year, especially if it's the first year, doesn't mean that that's what you're going to have to do every year moving forward. It's okay for this year to be different. You're not getting locked into something. Um, I'd kind of touched on this earlier is again, thinking about what is helpful for you. Is it, is it helpful? Do you feel energized by being with others or are you a little bit more, um, uh, is it helpful to have some alone time? Is that what kind of helps you to reset and to, and to build your energy? Any questions? I've been talking a lot. <laughs> or any thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's actually, it's, it's pretty amazing all of the um, things that we can do nowadays. Um, I've even seen now where uh, you can take part of um, someone's ashes and have them built into a painting. Um, I'm like, wow, that's pretty neat. 
Yeah. Yeah. So there's definitely a, a, a lot of different ways to kind of make it fitting to you and, and that you feel like really represent your person. <laughs> okay. So again, um, it's okay to take I say a, a holiday vacation, right? It's okay to say, and not just with holidays again, it can be anniversaries, birthdays. Um, don't have this expectation that I have to do something to recognize this day. It's okay to say, you know what, this year, I want to treat it like a normal day, like any other day. Okay. Listen to your gut. Um, it's okay if you feel like I'm not ready to celebrate this yet. I need to pass this year. That's totally fine. Give yourself that permission. Um, because with the holidays, it's, it's, it can be rough in that it's like a boom, boom, boom. You've got Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Um, and I've sometimes I've heard people say that New Year's is the most difficult, um, holiday because it represents passing of time. Um, so, you know, and just again, with usually more family time or, you know, social interactions and activities, um, cooking, decorating, whatever it might be, naturally the holidays, you know, can be kind of, uh, uh, exhausting <laughs> or a little energy draining. Um, so when you add grief on top of that, it can just feel like, okay, I got through Thanksgiving, but now I got to get ready for Christmas. Now I got to get ready for New Year's. So, um, I like the idea of planning a little vacation soon after the holidays to give yourself something to kind of look forward to. And when we say vacation, it doesn't have to be anything big and elaborate. You don't even have to go anywhere. Um, it's more of the idea of planning a special day or days for yourself. So if that means I'm going to sleep in, I've got a book series I want to get through. I'm going to load the house with my favorite foods. And that feels like a vacation, then that's your vacation. Um, so again, don't put limits on what a vacation could be. Um, and again, I was, I was kind of talking about, you know, it can feel, it can be draining. It can be a lot because it's three holidays so close together. Um, so it's okay if you kind of feel like you just kind of crash after or you're super drained, that is completely normal as well. All right. I did pretty good. I tend to be chatty and I went over last time I did this. So I was trying to be more mindful today so that we'd have time for just questions, thoughts, reactions. Yeah. Talked to his other grandma on the other side, uh, and they had her service last week. And um, I just been trying to comfort him and uh, give, hug him and stuff, but he said I don't want to talk about it. So, what would you suggest? How could I help him? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we can't we can't force someone to talk about it. We can't force them to be um, to ready, so to speak, to to face it. So, meet him where he's at. You know, if, if he doesn't want to talk about it, that's okay. Um, there's other ways you can support. Um, for instance, just um, sometimes even sending someone a text message because phone calls can sometimes feel like ugh, it takes more energy or it's, ugh, I don't want to feel sucked into a long conversation. So just receiving a text message um, of, oh, someone's thinking about me, you know, and that person can read it at their leisure or not feel obligated to respond can be a really simple and easy way to just show support. Um, again, sometimes we feel like we just, we need a break. We need a moment to not think. Um, so, you know, Hey, do you, do you want to go to dinner? You want to go see a movie, you know, just offering to maybe do something a little bit lighthearted or fun. Um, but, but yeah, just kind of meet them where they're at. <laughs> well, again, it's, it's recent, it's recent. So, um, because if, if, if someone isn't wanting to talk 
and we keep trying to get them to talk, they're likely just to shut down, right? Or to feel like they're not being heard. Um, so, you know, it's, we, we try to support them in, in ways that, that respect their boundary and, and where they're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then I'm yeah. going to, oh, I'm just suggesting for you, sorry, um, suggesting for you to just let him, as long as you know that whatever you say, you're there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing, because grief can make us feel out of control. So a step like that of, um, that was shared of, uh, you know, letting that person know that, Hey, I'm here whenever you're ready. You know, that helps to make them feel like they're in the driver's seat. Um, so thank you. Great suggestion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there anything? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. Keeping in mind things that are, have changed so much, even just from my generation to the teen generation now. Um, so that's a good point. Um, I did it again. I had something I was going to tell you guys and I just lost it. <laughs> Let's see. Um, mm, oh, got it. Okay. Um, so something else that's common. <laughs> something else that's common is, you know, when a loss is first happen to get a lot of phone calls or texts for people reaching out and saying, you know, like, oh, you know, if you need anything, let me know. Um, but it can be hard because, you know, a month later, two months later, sometimes we see that stuff start to drop off and we're seeing other people where it's like, oh, it seems like they've just kind of gone back to their normal life, but I'm still sitting here, you know, in this huge life change and, and in my grief. So, um, keeping in mind that, um, if we're supporting someone who's grieving that, um, it is an ongoing process, um, Anything else? I don't think I see anything online. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, uh-huh. Mm hmm. Yeah, no, that's, it's a good question. Because again, you can't, you can't put a timeline on it. I mean, especially when we look at, when we look at spouses, you know, if there's someone you've spent 30 years with, you know, you're not going to adjust to life without them within a matter of months or a year, you know, it's, it's normal to have those moments of, oh, I went to pick up the phone because I was so used to calling them on my lunch break, or, you know, I went to go tell them something. It's normal to have those moments because you have to give your brain time to adjust. Um, so, you know, like I said, it's, um, two major things I would look at. Um, in, in a nutshell is, um, again, is this person, um, are they able to sometimes have moments of a little bit of relief, a little bit of moments of joy, contentment, peace, or is it no, 100% of the time I'm, I'm feeling depressed. Um, that doesn't changes or it doesn't change. Um, the other thing is, is it impacting functioning? So, and again, it's, it's tricky. So I'm trying to explain it the best I can with grief. It's normal. 
um, to, especially when the loss is early to have a hard time getting out of bed or wanting to skip work or, you know, kind of withdrawing. But if that is continuing to go on where it's really causing a problem in that person's life, where I'm at risk of losing my job, um, things like that, where it's this constant ongoing, then that might be a good time to hmm, maybe let me go see my doctor um, or, you know, go get that checked out with um, like at a, a counseling center. Um, there is something um, in the mental health world that's now called prolonged grief disorder. And that's when grief symptoms, um, listen to the full thing. <laughs> it's when grief symptoms are lasting over a year and key, key point, because again, grief doesn't have a timeline. They are causing problems in functioning. Okay. Because again, grief doesn't go away. So it's okay to still have moments of grief even after a year, but is it at the point where it's, it's causing significant distress or problems in your daily functioning? So there's also that, that we now have as well. So, um, like I said, it, it's tricky because it can vary from person to person. So really the key things are, is it a constant with no moments of relief? And is it causing a problem in that person's life where it's really impacting their functioning? Yeah. Um, during this time, I'm also, trying, I'm also finding myself being buried with, I got to do this, I want to do that. You know, yes. Uh, Call it the busy work of grief. Yes. Yes. Sometimes, no, thank you for bringing that up. So sometimes when a loss has just happened, um, you can feel like, oh, I don't really feel anything or I don't feel like I'm responding because if you're in the role of you're having to arrange funeral arrangements or service arrangements, you know, figuring out uh, finances or, you know, dealing with property, the busy work of grief can also kind of delay or prevent you from being able to process the loss. So that definitely can play a role too at times. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for coming. I hope that was helpful. Um, is there anything you wanted to add? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add that um, if Anyone needs any additional resources, uh, we have our flyers for caring for the caregiver. Um, they're welcome to reach out to us here at the front desk. Uh, give us a call or visit our website, hospiceheart.org, anytime.